So I first heard about the Nordic Secret as one of those people who reads the book before it's um, ready for market. So the kind of early, you know, here's roughly what we're trying to say, what do you think? And very early I thought it was not only a great book project, but also potentially a documentary and maybe even a template for the rest of humanity, you know, to, to find a way to sort of, you know, figure out where we are and, and where we go from here. And part of what Perspectiva is trying to do is what this book speaks to, which is to understand the relationship between personal maturation and development and, and societal change and the right kinds of societal change and understanding what it is to grow as a, as a human being, to awaken in certain ways and how that might inform the kinds of decisions we make collectively and getting into that complex relationship and understanding it better. So that's roughly what we're about and roughly what tonight's about. So without further ado, let's welcome initially Thomas and then Lena. So first of all, Thomas Bjorkman, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the 1870s, all of the Nordic countries were amongst the poorest countries in Europe. 70 years later, before the Second World War, we were all, all the Nordic countries, on top of almost every list. We were industrialized, we were rich, we were happy, and we were democratic. And I believe that right now we are facing a similar societal transition that might be even greater than we went from agrarian to industrial, from non-democratic to democratic. We think that there is a lot that we could learn from the way that the Nordic countries manage this very chaotic transition 150 to 100 years ago. So the starting point for, for writing the book was really that we found a few old newspaper articles. Um, we found these early Swedish politicians and um, intellectuals, mainly social democratic but also liberal, talking about this transition that they knew were in front of them in uh, a way that um, I hadn't heard before. They wanted to build democracy and they wanted to build democracy bottom up. So how did they do that? Well, they had all read the German uh, idealist philosophers. And these thinkers they reacted very, very strongly against the Enlightenment view of our mind as a rational machine. These German idealist thinkers said that that's not the case. Our mind is an organic system and it's, all, it's totally embodied in our body and it's also embedded in culture. And even more, it is under constant development throughout life. It's under constant formation. And formation in German is Bildung. So they were talking about the Bildung of our mind, the lifelong Bildung of our mind. And how we, through this lifelong Bildung of our mind, could find our own inner compass and stop being de totally dependent on external authority, but to find an inner authority. The German idealists uh, they were just talking about this freedom and beauty, by the way, for the bourgeoisie. They did not see the, the peasants, the farmers, the sharecroppers as a potential political class. They were just thinking about all this building stuff and all this freedom and beauty for themselves. What happened in Denmark was that there was a pastor who realized that there was the French Revolution. There were all these revolutions in 1830. Sooner or later, the people will participate in the political power. Um, we have to, I mean, they have to have some sort of education so they understand what kind of society they're in. They need to be self-governing. Self they need to be uh, playing by the rules and they need to be loyal citizens. And so he realizes that the peasants, farmers, sharecroppers will have to be political subjects at some point. And that's when he starts thinking about what kind of education do they need. By the turn of the last century, uh, they had formed a number of retreat centers in all the Nordic countries, where young adults were to spend four to six months with the expressed intention of finding themselves and finding inner direction. When we get to around 1900, there are a hundred of these 
uh, folk high schools across Denmark, and it's we've calculated that probably around 8.5% of the cohort who goes to one of these folk high schools, which means that if you have 50% of the population living in the countryside, it's about 15% of the young farmers who go to one of these folk high schools for three to five, six months. But the sad part of the story is that the purpose of these retreat centers and these uh, self-facilitating groups, we lost that purpose somewhere around or after the Second World War. The original purpose of personal inner development to support the development of democracy, that is more or less uh, forgotten today. We're about to go through something, and it might just seem at certain points, where on earth am I, what's going on? Suffice to say, there is an approximate map. Uh, in each stage, we're asking you to do something that maps loosely onto the story of Bildung and the story of societal development in, in parallel with personal development. I am your feudal Lord Simon, so I want you all to look at me now, okay? You have no choice in looking at me, because if you don't do what I say, you're going to die. So Simon says, touch your head. Simon says, touch your shoulders. Both hands, please. Touch your ears. Sit down. <laughs> don't look at him, please. <laughs> This is you having to do what you do based on basic survival, okay? Uh, you're not really aware of what's happening around you because you're so focused on me because you know that you haven't got a choice. You have to do what I say and I do see everything. When we play this round, what I want is for a couple of you to disobey me, okay? But instead of me judging you necessarily, everyone else is going to judge you. Simon says, Touch your head. This guy's not doing it. Can everyone look at this man here? The man not touching his head. And I just want you to look at them like they're the worst person you've ever seen. Hey. They are ruining everything. Just look at them. Don't say anything yet. Just look at them. Make them feel it without saying anything. <laughs> and now I want you all to to say nice and loud, we're still looking at them. We disapprove of you. We disapprove of you. And now I want you to whisper to them, but we admire you secretly. <laughs> so now you're all individuals, okay? So uh, instead of uh, doing what I say, you've got your own ideas, okay? So what I want you to do is to command yourself every single person in this room voicing what your command is and then following your own command. Hey, touch your I'm self-offering, I can do this myself. I know what to do. So I want you to get into three groups. So if you can uh, organize yourselves into systems, souls and society. Who would like to speak for souls? We're all speaking. We're all speaking. We're all speaking. We oh, that's speaking. radical. Okay. I matter. I am all systems in this universe. And First of all, souls need a society to transform. Systems need a society to develop beyond just empty theories. Take a moment to reflect among yourselves. What is missing? What do I have? What do I lack? Who would like to speak for souls? What is it you feel like you're lacking? We talked about being embodied and um, having perspective. We lack the disturbance from you guys that will actually allow us to move into a, a better system because we'll just stay the same otherwise. We admire the souls because you've got the individual and the, the, the people. Each person matters. And for the systems, they take away that firing chaos, they give some sort of structure so that you've got functionality and organisation. We began speaking about the journey of development, which is outlined in the Nordic Secret, but which applies across humanity. And we saw in that world, we moved from unconscious union through differentiation and integration into conscious union, which I hope you're feeling now as we end the event. Thank you very much. And give yourselves a round of applause.